Amidst the upheavals of the 19th century Qing Empire, which was the ruling power of China at the time, revolutionary movements were brewing. One, led by the self-proclaimed mystic Hong Xiuquan, known as the Taiping Rebellion, sought to overthrow the dynasty through a crusade blending zealous religiosity with utopian visions of equality. The resulting nearly 14-year-long internal conflict engulfed this Asian giant into utter chaos, leading to economic ruin, social divides, and over 20 million deaths. With its apocalyptic fervor and almost unfathomable devastation, the clash stands as one of history's bloodiest conflicts. The seeds of resentment were planted in 1837 when Hong, an impoverished village teacher, experienced intense religious visions following his failed civil service examinations. Convinced these visions meant he was the brother of Jesus, destined to reform his struggling country. He sought to spread his mystical beliefs across the lands. He preached a distorted form of Christianity, mixed with his own messianic delusions, denouncing Confucianism and the corruption of the Qing imperial state. Hong's unorthodox, zealous blending of a popular growing religion at the time and revolutionary rhetoric won him legions of adherents amongst the peasant classes, creating a burgeoning sect that quickly spread across rural areas of the nation. In 1850, he officially launched his quest to establish the Taiping Kingdom, naming himself the Heavenly King. The revolutionaries saw themselves on a divine mission to cleanse their homeland of evil and introduce a pseudo-Christian utopia of equality. Thus began the empire's cataclysmic civil war. But Hong's vision did not emerge from thin air. It was forged in the oppressive and turbulent conditions that plagued the Qing powers at the time. This Asian superpower, which had held sway since 1644, grappled with several internal and external crises that undercut its legitimacy and authority. The Opium Wars, from 1839 to 1842 and 1856 to 1860, between the Empire and Britain, resulted in humiliating defeats for the Qing, forcing them to cede Hong Kong and open several ports to foreign trade and influence. The Treaty of Nanjing, in 1842, imposed unjust terms on the struggling people, such as extraterritoriality, which allowed foreigners immunity from the nation's laws and jurisdiction. These episodes, among many others, sparked widespread resentment and discontent among the local people, who felt betrayed and exploited by their own court, let alone the foreign powers. Hong was one of those who felt the sting of these events. He had studied hard for the civil service examinations, the only way for commoners to rise in the social hierarchy and serve in the court. Unfortunately, he failed four times, which dashed all hopes and ambitions for this path in life. He also saw the devastation in the land at the time, known as China's Century of Humiliation, which undermined his faith in the dynasty. He felt estranged and disillusioned by the society in which he lived. Hong found solace and inspiration in a pamphlet he had received from a Protestant missionary a year prior. The pamphlet contained images and explanations of Christian doctrines, such as the creation, the fall, and redemption. Intrigued but puzzled by these ideas, he retained the pamphlet for later study. After his fourth failure in 1837, Hong fell ill and underwent the series of visions that would reshape his life and China. He professed to have met God, who appointed him as his second son to eradicate the demons plaguing his homeland. Claiming he also met Jesus, who gifted him a sword and a seal, Hong interpreted these visions as signals that he was chosen by God to spearhead a holy war against the Qing dynasty, which he deemed evil and demonic. Now, rather than acting immediately on his visions, the future leader took to returning to his teaching career, and he kept his beliefs secret for several years. In 1843, he met his cousin Feng Yunshan, also a Christian convert, and a missionary of the God-worshipping society, a sect at the time that mixed Christianity with Chinese folk religion. They developed religious doctrines based on the leader's visions and understanding of Christianity. They denounced traditional Chinese culture, such as Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, general ancestor worship, idolatry, polygamy, and foot-binding as sinful or demonic. They championed social reforms like land redistribution, communal ownership, gender equality, and literacy education as part of their heavenly mandate. Their avant-garde beliefs and norms soon clashed with the ruling authorities, who viewed them as heretics and rebels. In 1850, after several skirmishes with Qing troops, Hong officially singled himself out as Heavenly King 
and unveiled his goals to topple the dynasty and establish the Taiping Kingdom. His idea was bolstered by other polycentral leaders, such as Yang Xiuqing, who claimed to voice God's will, Xiao Chao Gui, who considered himself the Holy Ghost, and Feng Yunshan, who posited himself as the South King. Collectively, they led their devotees into a holy war that would lock the country in unparalleled bloodshed. After seizing the key Yangtze River city of Nanjing in 1853, they proclaimed it their capital and springboard for expansion. At its zenith, the kingdom governed significant areas of the southern and central parts of the giant Asian nation. In accord with messianic visions, the rebels banned heretic practices in territories under their theocratic rule. Their mix of Christianity and revolutionary zest was propagated through propaganda publications and religious pamphlets, cementing grassroots zealotry in their followers. You see, the Qing initially misjudged the intensity and support for the revolt, but soon insurgent victories threatened the imperial heartlands. Faced with rebel battalions nearing Beijing in 1853, the court undertook drastic reforms of their military structure and capabilities to address the existential threat. The two sides soon became entrenched in a state of total war. Yet the Taiping Kingdom was also neither harmonious nor stable. Devastated by internal power struggles, ideological conflicts and administrative challenges, its cohesion and effectiveness were undermined. As time lingered on, Hong Xiuquan grew increasingly isolated and suspicious in his heavenly palace, indulging in luxuries and pleasures while forsaking his responsibilities as heavenly king. He also ordered mass executions of anyone who questioned his authority or challenged his visions, such as Yang Xiuqing, who claimed to voice God's will, Xiao Chao Gui, who portrayed himself as the Holy Ghost, and Wei Changhui, who announced himself as the North King. Such purges dampened the rebel leadership and morale, leading to divisions and factions among the rebels. Hong refused to name a successor or delegate his personal authority to anyone else, fostering confusion and uncertainty among his followers about their future. He did, however, assign most administrative and military matters to his younger brother Hong Rengan, a more pragmatic and open-minded individual. Rengan endeavored to overhaul the Taiping court and society by introducing modern institutions, technologies, and policies. His efforts were met with resistance or indifference by many of his fellow Taipings, who favored Hong Xiuquan's mystic teachings and practices. They also encountered opposition from the Qing court, which had reorganized its forces under loyalist generals like Zheng Guofan and Li Hongzhang. These generals formed and trained regional troops known as the Xiang Army or the Huai Army, which were more disciplined, efficient, and equipped than regular Qing fighters. They also took on Western weapons and tactics from foreign advisors or mercenaries like Frederick Townsend Ward or Charles George Gordon. The regiments of the court gradually retook their lost territories by besieging and capturing key revolutionary forts like Zhenjiang, Anqing, Suzhou, Hangzhou, and Nanjing. This inflicted heavy losses on the Taiping troops, who relied heavily on their zeal rather than their military skills. The insurgent battalions often marched into suicidal battles without proper planning or coordination, believing they were invincible and favored by God. At this time, the Taiping heavily enforced their social and religious reforms in their domains, which were overwhelmingly radical and controversial by the Chinese standards of that time period, abolishing private property and establishing communal ownership of land and wealth. They also instituted gender equality and allowed women to serve in the army or public offices. They also took to banning any activities seen as sinful or harmful, enforcing strict gender segregation in public and private spaces, requiring men and women to live separately in different camps or villages. They completely replaced Chinese culture with their version of the perfect society, drawing heavily from Hong Xiuquan's visions and interpretations of the Bible. Unfortunately, this also involved the destruction of temples, shrines, idols, and books, among other items they deemed idolatrous or demonic, and required all Taiping citizens to adopt new names, hairstyles, and clothing styles that mirrored their identity. They marched into suicidal battles, assured of their invincibility and divine favor, resulting in horrific casualty rates when Qing forces encircled and gradually decimated the rebel strongholds. Trapped in the crossfire, innumerable civilians endured unimaginable suffering. Agricultural collapse due to desolated farmlands led to devastating famines. Marauding troops massacred entire hamlets suspected of sympathizing with the insurgents. Some Westerners even supported or assisted the uprising, 
offering them weapons and training. One of the Americans mentioned earlier, Frederick Townsend Ward, particularly stood out, forming the ever-victorious army, a mercenary legion comprising Chinese and Western soldiers who fought for the Taiping cause. However, as the hostilities dragged on and threatened their interests, these states ultimately chose to side with the Qing dynasty against the revolutionary forces. In the end, they perceived the insurgent fighters as a potential danger to their economic and political sway and an agitator of violence in the region. Also, they doubted their authenticity as a Christian sect, viewing their wild beliefs as heretical or fanatical. Hence, they intervened in the hostilities, lending military and diplomatic aid to the court. Their involvement significantly shaped the course of events. The intervention was critical in steering the balance of power toward the dynasty and expediting the end of the revolt, but also increasing the country's reliance on foreign entities. It ignited a deep resentment and mistrust of Western civilization and religion, perceived as sources of degradation and exploitation. Despite their unwavering dedication, a complicated mix of internal leadership struggles and the court's military tenacity gradually chipped away at Taiping's capabilities to fight. In late 1853, Hong retreated from public life, frequently ordering large-scale executions of those he saw as threats, while still declining to appoint a successor. His absence at the helm left military commanders with autonomy, thereby diluting coordination efforts against the Qing. After years of damaging warfare, the court's reinforcements armed with European weaponry and tactics finally began to gain ground through a series of victories. In 1864, Nanjing, the capital of the kingdom, fell after a year-long siege. The breakdown of the city led to Hong being poisoned by one or many of his subordinates, and isolated pockets of resistance finally capitulated the following year, thus bringing the chaos to an end. This ruinous end left China economically, socially, and psychologically drained for decades, and the disastrous finale fueled perceptions of Christian teachings as dangerous fanaticism moving forward. Fearful of further foreign encroachment, court rulers became even more conservative than before, resisting both reform and Western integration. Yet the uprising did also undermine the authority of the dynasty at its core, as interestingly, within just five decades, the Qing themselves would be overthrown in the 1911 revolution. The rebellion was not an absolute failure. It held some positive or constructive influence over Chinese history and progress by spurring later reform movements and revolutionary thinkers in the mainland, who learned from both the blunders and accomplishments. Some regarded their bravery and vision with admiration, seeking to replicate their spirit of resistance and innovation. Some adopted and adapted Taiping's proto-socialist and religious ideology, striving to implement them in a more moderate or more realistic manner. The self-strengthening movement, from 1861 to 1895, for instance, was the initiative of a few Qing officials and elites, seeking to modernize the country's military, industry, education, and foreign diplomacy by learning from Western advances. They hoped to fortify China's defenses and sovereignty against foreign aggression and intervention. And finally, the Xinhai Revolution, from 1911 to 1912, which was the first successful attempt by Chinese revolutionaries and nationalists to overthrow the Qing dynasty. These reform movements and revolutions were inspired by the Taiping Rebellion in numerous ways. For instance, they were led or supported by former followers or sympathizers such as Hong Rengan, Li Hongzhang, Sun Yat-sen, and Song Jiaoren, who adopted the revolutionaries' policies or slogans such as Expel the Foreigners, Restore China, or Equalize Land, from the days in the Taiping. Stemming from a distorted blend of Christianity, Hong's messianic delusions, and exploited lower-class rage, the conflict wreaked apocalyptic devastation across China for over a decade, being so fierce that it, along with the many other revolts in China at the time, nearly dethroned the formidable Qing dynasty. This dramatic rise and fall of the Taiping story still fascinates and haunts historians worldwide, 